Uh, last uh, couple years, we've done like a four-part panel. I've had uh, three or four people up here asking questions from the floor. And uh, when we're asking questions from the floor, uh, you know, it answers your question, but don't answer everybody's question. And uh, so I thought I would do something a little different and come up with some things I think that would be maybe that would pertain to more of a general group than just running, come on, than just running for just, um, just questions of that. <clears throat> so uh, that's what I'm going to look at in uh, doing so and talk about it. But we are thrilled. We're thankful for what God's doing and where he's providing our people. Very excited about tonight. Uh, some of them hold back for tonight. And uh, then I always get asked, well, what if it doesn't happen like it has the last few years? Then the consolation is, I'm going to preach. Lay hands on the sick. In part. But I believe God's got a whole lot in store for uh, for his people. Amen. Amen. Is David lagging? Finishing his coffee. All right. They're still coming in here. We've got a few more minutes. Glory to God. You now, a lot of, most of you know my, uh, my story. Uh, I'd say in this room right now, dad's not in here. I'd say sitting in this room today, uh, the person who's known me the longest would be Dave Robinson. Dave, how long has it been? 35, 37? 37 years we go back. And um, so that's quite a, uh, well, I don't know. The panty just, I just thought about it. The panty just probably more. Yeah, so the, uh, it had it, been, um, I came to youth camp in uh, 81. You weren't here in, 81, in the 81 area, were you? 84. So, uh, so yeah, so, uh, so uh, 80, 81, uh, we were all in youth camps together. Uh, Panty just church, this church, several churches. So if you look at that, yeah, this couple here probably. And then, then Dave, ministry-wise, me preaching, uh, uh, Dave has probably been closer in seeing that transpire at the, uh, at the level because he became very connected and became Pastor Rothwell's pastor. So uh, uh, that was very uh, close for years and became, according to the documents, uh, according to the documents, when Dad redid the documents here years ago, uh, in the documents, Dave Robinson was in there as the spiritual father advisor. So something would happen to Pastor Rothwell, Dave Robinson was the voice with the elders. So he's been very close, very, very close knit to that. All right. It's two minutes till, um, I'm going to put this on just for the sake of, I brought it over. <clears throat> I can't preach without one. People have asked me. I was at the church where Dustin and Misty pastor years ago. I've been, June was, was the 26th straight year I've done a revival in that church. 26 years. And uh, there was a guy there. He's done, passed on now. Uh, this guy was cantankerous about everything. He didn't attend that church. He just attended all the revival meetings. <laughs> cantankerous. He complained about everything. He complained because I didn't spit three rows deep. He complained about me not only just having a jacket because I kept it buttoned. And so he says, I like a preacher that fights bees, you know, just always that way. And he says, I don't know if a man could stay anointed with a jacket on. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, judge. They called him the judge. Not because he was a judge, just because he's judgmental everything. And, uh. And so, uh, and, uh, 
well, if you keep it on. He said, well, why do you keep it buttoned? I said, because nowadays I still can. <laughs> he didn't like anything we said. But anyway, uh, praise God. Uh, uh, he's got his reward. I pray he's got a good one. <laughs> uh, but anyway, well, praise God. Uh, I want to, I want to read a, uh, a verse. Uh, I think I left, uh, Je- uh, Jacob on my desk. Well, there, there's two, there's two p- papers on my desk. I printed them off. I think I laid them around on my desk. Yeah, it's all unlocked. Janine's over there. Um, uh, I, I do know the verse I'm going to read. Uh, if you've got a Bible, come on up here, Dave, when you're ready. Uh, if you've got a Bible, go to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. For several years, all I did was uh, I would share in one of the morning services. And then when I had Brother Terry doing the morning services, I didn't even preach in the morning. And one of the things I got from so many people, they wanted to hear from me. And uh, that may not have been all of you. uh, But that's the one thing we got. Uh, A lot of us are connected to you, what we're doing. We'd like to hear. And that's why I've been preaching on Sunday night and uh, doing that. And then on uh, the last couple of years, trying to do something in the a forum side of it uh, on this question and, and answer part. But I'm going to read First Peter 1. Uh, I'll just start reading at verse 6, which I don't like starting any email or letter in the middle of it. But we're going to start this. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me fold this back here where I can hold it. All right. Whom have you not seen you love? Though now you do not see him, yet believe. You rejoice with joy inexpressible, or we'd say joy unspeakable, right? That's what they said. And full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, I just want to just pause there because I wanted to look at that. Receiving the end of your faith. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about faith and believing. Can you guys see us all right? Because we're just going to kind of be relaxed and me just setting up in the pulpit. Are we okay? You want us to put our chairs up here where you can see us better? Yes. Okay. Let's do that. Angel and I did this one night up here. All right. Uh, is that better? Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the seeing of your faith... I want to talk about this faith because I think people's got a lot of zeal. But what concerns me about world missions or ministry period is how we have brought our faith up with our desires. A desire to do something doesn't mean that we have faith to accomplish it. We just have a desire. A lot of people desire to be healed. They just don't have faith to get it done or how to release faith and accomplish it. A lot of people want to live financially blessed. They just don't know how to release their faith to get there. And I believe that there is a, something that we could call seeing the end of your faith or where your faith comes to an end. You, you reach that. There's a transitional period. I call it the corridor of patience, a transitional corridor 
uh, of faith and patience. The corridor of it starts at the place where you say, I'll, I'll demonstrate this. The, the, the corridor of it is when you start at a place and you, according to Mark eleven twenty three, 23, whosoever say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. This is where you release your faith. Faith is released in words. This is where you release your faith. Now, just because you say you believe you receive, you actually have to believe you receive. When? According to verse 24, when you pray. Okay? When you pray. That's what you believe you receive. When you pray. Now, there is a time in here that I call this corridor of patience. This is where your faith, which is your belief system, is going to be tried. There's energy when you see something and need something, I believe. I speak to that mountain. When I say that, the door to the supernatural opens. But just like in the book of Daniel, it said Daniel prayed, but at 21 days. But God answered the first day, the prince of Persia, not a natural prince, but a spiritual prince demon, withheld that until Michael came. You know the story. But in this is this transitional period, and I think a lot of people hang out here. This is where life is. This is where is survival. A lot of... This is where you say, look, it's in my hands. I'm believing for this, and look, it's actually here. See, you can't drive a promise. You can't live in a promise. You can't can't say, well, God promised me a new building. Well, you're, you're not preaching in that promise. One day you've got to step in that new building. One day you sit in that car or that truck or that plane or whatever it is. While it's still in the realm of promise, you're not driving it, walking in it, or preaching from it. It's still in the realm of promise. Eventually, things have to become a reality. It starts at that point, I believe, in this point, here it is, evidence. Evidence. Now, the word of God is our evidence through this whole thing. But it's lost in here, and I call it patience. The Bible said through faith and They inherited, it didn't say just through faith. It's through through faith and patience. I like to say it this way. Faith is what opens the door to the supernatural. Patience is what keeps the door open. Faith opens the door. I see patience as a, just as a spiritual force where patience stands in that doorway and says, you're not closing That's right. until I have it in my hand. Amen. That's patience. So in this corridor is where things are lost. And a lot of times people don't realize they lost it in this corridor. And they keep saying, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. I thought God. I thought, 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 thought. All of that dictates that something was lost in this corridor period. Are you with me? So what happens happens in here this is where it's one means your heart's got to stay right your mouth's got to stay right your attitude's got to stay right you can't be offended you can't do anything uh brother white if you want to set up when he's front rows you with your long legs go ahead feel free so if it's going to be offended uh if anybody's going to be offended they're not going to get it so that's that corridor that's that corridor that i'll talk about It's there. So God wants us to see the end of our faith, the victory of that faith. He wants us to see that. But that can be messed with when the manifestations show up because the Bible says when hope is postponed or delayed, it makes what? Heart sick. So somewhere in this transition period, we can get uh, sick hearted. And that's where it's at. So, I want to talk about things that I believe discourages missionaries, discourages ministry. And I sent this list to Pastor David last night. And uh, yeah, please. Uh, On that, the way that I 
even this verse, receiving the hang on, hang on. We got to have a mic. Oh. I'm not, I'm not you will in a second. Let me see. Oh, it's not turned on. Hang on. Oh, okay. I'm so used to them having turned on. All right, go ahead. Um, on that verse that you read, receiving the end of your faith, you talked about the corridor of transition, but it says, even the salvation of your soul. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people, as I, I've taught our people, is, you know, there's a difference between being born again and being saved. Right. There's a lot of people that are born again, but they're not free. And so the salvation of the soul, I've looked at as the soul being the mind, the will, and the motion. Yeah. That's, that's the mental battle, right? In that corridor that you talked about, that's it's a, mental, it's a battle. mental battle. Yeah. And uh, right now in the United States, we live in such an emotionally driven um, country. People are being led by their emotions, not by the spirit. And so it's in that corridor where they mess up because... That's where your emotions start kicking yeah. in and your thoughts start and you're battling the thoughts and everything like that and why a lot of people don't receive the end of their, their right. faith. Or you know, the Bible says hope, which is the image. It's your expectation, the blueprint to it. The Bible says hope becomes the anchor to the soul. Once an anchor loses the ability to anchor, you drift everywhere. So hope anchors the soul. So a lot of people begin to drift like a boat that the anchor no longer catches. They begin to drift where they drift. Whatever wave is moving, you no longer control it. So that's right. Uh, I was on the board of an organization, which I believe it. I'm saying these things not to be teachy or preachy. These are things that I deal with. I was on the board of an organization just as a consultant, as a uh, member of the for consultant to be an advisor. That's the better word. And uh, this ministry uh, was in a place to where they, uh, they were in a maritime type ministry. They had, they had boat, they did ministry from it. Uh, they believe God showed them they were going to have a larger boat. And uh, so they sold what they had, believing for the other one. Now, I watched this ministry go through an area where they may not have had more than enough. They may have just had just enough, but they had enough. And they were doing it. Once they started advertising about this massive boat, it'd be like me. I don't know if, you know, not everybody understands airplanes. I fly, I have, God has provided a Cessna 182, which is a four place airplane, but it's, it's bigger than the four place training airplanes. It's a high performance airplane. They'll be flying it again today. Uh, brother Ron be helping people. People have come to me and said, um, what if somebody came and handed you a jet? What would you do today? I said, uh, I don't know, probably sell it. Put the ministry. Well, why would you do that? Well, because going from a Cessna 182, it's not the problem of maybe going through enough training to fly it. The point is maintaining it. Pastor Barkley airplane two before this one you know had to change brakes and it was $27,000 a windshield $180,000 uh, you're talking about or the paint job and all end up being a, almost $180,000 $200,000 you're talking about a minimum $180,000 $200,000 a year just to maintenance it mine's $2,000 this last time was about 5,000 because we had a lot of work done to it. That's the annual. So if you don't build your faith to that, then what you have is something that's talked about, look, look, look what they have. But people suffer because they're not honest where they're at. So going back to this ministry, I was very close with them. I was pastoring them. Uh, 
uh, I was their ministry uh, leader, their pastor. And they just kept declining, 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 declining. They took almost everything off the sail of the other one boat and they gave it away. You think seed time and harvest. They kept declining, kept declining, kept declining. And uh, I was in, I was called into a board meeting and uh, they were talking about this boat was going to be so many hundreds of thousands of dollars and this is going to happen. It all sounds good. Eventually, I said, let me, let me say something. Let's go back to, we can't even pay rent, hardly on time. We can't maintain a road vehicle on time. The problem is, we're believing for something that's beyond our faith. Faith is ever increasing. Now, we're believing for something beyond our faith level. So what's happened is faith works. It just works. And they kept saying, this is what we're believing for. And all of their faith was hanging on that large ship. And they extracted their faith from how we pay rent, how we raise kids, how we buy food. And they designated all of their faith to a boat that they couldn't obtain and there was no way to maintain. Well, you know God. All right, I know God, but I know God operates by spiritual laws. You know God. So as soon as we disconnected and let God bring that into the picture when it was time, and allocate faith back to live, things start changing. And what concerns me, why missionaries struggle so much on the field, you use all of your faith on things and you designate it to projects and you suffer as individuals. You have got to balance. Does this sound right? You've got to balance this faith. Come on. If you're hungry and you take the whole pot of biscuits and give it, you set it aside for something else and you're sitting there starving. You're going to have to say, no, we're going to have to keep some things back for us. And so that brings me to the place I started preaching in Kenya 25, 26 years ago. And that is... I watch people. We used to have a lot of people from Kenya come here to this conference. A particular person came and was, he could sell a vision better than anybody. You know, the right tears, the right words, the right inflection. And people gave money for him to build a building. And I preached that I did a crusade that the church was birthed out of. And he built a building. I come to find out he didn't even own the land, lease the land. After the building was done, I love iron, you know, iron sheets. The sons of the man he leased the land from because he couldn't pay the lease came and tore the building. He rebuilt. They came and tore the building down. Now he's no longer in that area. He's in a total area of Kenya. And that's when I started preaching. It's easy to know how to sell a vision to obtain something. But if you don't bring your faith to the maintaining level, you will spend your life in misery on the mission field. So you cannot just obtain. Some people, if you're here and you're trying to obtain something beyond the level of faith you develop to maintain it, I would be very honest with myself going back to the level Of saying, what is it I'm really actually able to believe for and not lose track of how to live and yet knowing how to maintain and believe God for that. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Once you know the will of God for something, you can manage it. You got something you want to say? No, it's just within what you just said, you can't lose sight of the the pressure in in your mind. That's where it comes back to Romans 12, 2, to renew your mind. Uh, and you'll be transformed to, to walk through this. And that emotional thing, the people at least I deal with, 
that emotional pressure cooker is where the vast majority of them lose out and, and can't get to the end of their faith. They, they know enough Bible, they know enough, you know, uh, things, but, but they haven't learned to manage that thought process, process of casting down thoughts, of, of staying engaged in it. Brother Hagen, I quote him because he so influenced my life, you know, back in the 80s when I first heard what Word of Faith was. And I went to Rhema. I didn't know a Kenneth Hagin existed. Somebody just said, we'll help you go. All right. I'd never been to Tulsa for my life. When I showed up in Tulsa, God's in my witness. I never met anybody in Tulsa. Somebody had been there, gave me one phone number of somebody they met at a meeting. I called them when I got into town, and they let me sleep in the bottom bunk of their kid. I didn't know anybody when I showed up there. Never heard of it. Never heard of Kenneth Hagin preach i just showed up at rhema i don't advise that kind of behavior but that's just how it worked on my behalf so brother hagan told a story about back when him and aretha was really uh getting her first home he had all the ministry stuff going on he believed god for this house they they needed to do things and so uh when they got in it she says now we need this we need this we need that and she says and kenneth we need curtains he said aretha if you want curtains you're gonna have to hang them on your own faith because my faith is maxed out so the point is you have to find a place to where i'm at the point to where i can't add anything else on it remember i said this the first day you can say whatever you want to say but you can only accomplish what you believe you cannot accomplish things outside of your belief system all right so that brings me, before we get into the main question, things to answer, uh, did you want, did you, is the aspect, I was in Zambia a few years ago and really hit this, ministry versus preaching. I started telling people, you can preach without money. One person's. Uh, the Epperson said that somebody from Uganda contacted them and they're going to disciple 70 some people online. All right. You have an internet, but that's all the expense you have other than your time. You can go to the corner with a Bible and preach. You can go to the mall and preach. You can preach without money, but you can't do ministry without money. And that's what people's got to understand. Don't have such a zeal that you go to the field and all you have enough money to do is preach. You got to be able to do ministry. I, I'm thankful that they're in a the process now delivering equipment. In Zambia, we, we built a school here. We built a school on our property in Zambia. Then we bought a large piece of property adjacent connects to the property. It's up on a hill. God has given us favor with the government there. But and to, to, to accomplish this, to accomplish this, we needed the proper amount of internet. And uh, we sent money last week or week before last to put up a 32-foot, 42-foot internet tower that will reach wirelessly 200 kilometers. The government will pay us to keep it on that property. Preaching is one thing. Doing ministry is something else. And I see a lot of people miserable because you got a desire to do something but your, your heart has grown sick because you are not being able to see the end of it. And I believe that's what God wants to help us with, to take this as we walk on that. So let's not confuse preaching. When you preach, you minister to people. But to do ministry work, build buildings, build schools, build shelters for typhoons, uh, infrastructure, uh, crusades, uh, that's, 
doing ministry. It costs you something. And the first currency it's going to cost you is faith. Faith is heavenly currency. And that's the first possession that you get. Want to add something? You're good. You're off quiet for David Shipman. All right. These are, these are questions. Uh, I talked to John Matika years ago, and uh, we, I, we did it. We put some things together and whatever. And uh, he called it. I asked him to talk about things. What keeps missionaries awake at night? How many of those are saying keep pastors awake if you let it? So how many missionaries are here? All right. So uh, one of the main things that keeps missionaries awake at night is all going to be connected with M-O-N-E-Y. Why? Why? M-O-N-E. Why? <laughs> because that's what it takes. And there's not a person up here, some way or another, didn't mention something about monthly partners. Somebody partner monthly with them. And uh, To not exclude people, wouldn't you add in, besides the missionaries, even pastors? That, yes. Or evangelists? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. Ministry that people that needs that. So, not having supporters. This is something that we're all anybody that does ministry is always going to have that on there pastor barkley has that jet 40 percent. i know it serving on a board of his i know only 40 percent of the people that he preaches for is able to even cover his fuel costs forgets honorarium his fuel cost 60% 60% of the places he goes can't even cover his fuel cost. So for him to fly that jet, he got home before I did last night. Absolutely. I was driving home. I checked my app to see where he's at. And when I called him, he was already home. That's a pretty good way to travel. Uh, my grandson, Josh took him back to the airplane and my grandson got invited to come on the jet to see it. And he looked at, he looked at his daddy and says, I thought, I thought his plane was like Papa's. I said, no, 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 <laughs> no, this is a whole nother world, son, a whole nother world. But anyway, without partners, he can't do that. You understand? Living word church is living word church. He pastors, they have their own. But without ministry partners of leaving him, he can't do that. So we understand everything we do, it takes partners to accomplish it. Amen. So we want people to be able to understand we see the need and we understand that partners are important. But you can't just have partners to fulfill your heart. You have to be able to do something that partners know that you're interested in their outcome as well and their well-being. People that give in this meeting, they give because they hear something, they see it, but a partner's going to be there through thin and thick with you. Yeah. And that's what, it's, that's what it's all. We may partner with you with a certain project, but that monthly yeah. partnership is what makes things go. Yeah. Amen? So not having support will keep people up, up at night. How many is say that's been your biggest concern or the enemy's messed with you greatly is not the, not the ability to know what to do. It's how do we get the money to get it done? Amen. How many be honest with that? The majority. Amen. Say something on that. Well, uh, I mean, I, I obviously definitely see the battle in it. I have been able to navigate to where it doesn't keep me up at night. Um, but there's always a financial need. And one of the things um, that's really been on my heart is the verse in 2 Corinthians uh, that you may abound to every good work. And what I see 
uh, even within our, our own ministry and other ministries, is there's not too much abounding to every good work. There's scraping to every good work. Mm-hmm. There's getting 80% of every good work, 90% of every good work. But to me, abounding is that we should be able, by the word of God, to beat this money thing. I, I don't think we should be staying up at night being concerned about it and knowing that, um, you know, is it going to happen? And uh, it puts pressure on us. Again, one of the things that I deal with so many times in our church is you got to beat this emotional thing. And now for me, I always use Tammy and I as because uh, we're like polar opposites. Uh, and I say the, the battle that I have in walking with God is my logic. And because uh, logic doesn't work good with faith because faith has no logic in it. The battle that she has is emotions because she's a very emotional person. And um, uh, I I can only speak from one side of it because I'm not a real emotional person. So I think that uh, uh, it was easier for me to beat and not be led by my emotions. But what I got to battle is not being led by my head and and making things make logical sense and and getting out of the the faith arena because of the way that I think. But I, I think it's an easier element for me than somebody who is has submitted to their emotions and they've become led by their emotions. And it, it, to me, now I'm not in that, so I can't say specifically, it's just by observation, is people have a hard time being led by the spirit when their emotions are so far involved in the leading. And uh, so you, this corridor of transition, in that corridor, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional, uh, or a pressure cooker is what I call it, is uh, uh, you've got to be able to beat that, know that the word of God is true no matter what I'm feeling, no matter what I'm seeing, no matter what I'm dealing with. And Dr. Uh, Mize has been hitting on that 2 Corinthians 4.18, quit looking at what you're seeing, get beyond it. And so that's the only thing I'd add to it. Yeah. Uh, I'm so convinced in, in spiritual laws. I've said this for years. I may not understand everything, but I believe God has given me supernatural insight and ability to grasp spiritual laws what happens when they are enforced and what happens when they're violated it's just something that it's always been in me uh people talk about churches well you know you pastor a church you don't have to worry about your income folks i spent 12 years on the road there was a, there was a a pastoring thing. Uh, I've never done anything for money. Matter of fact, the reputation is people said they've had to watch what they say around me because they know if I got the ability, I'll do it hardly without even praying about it because I love helping people. That's what I do. But prior to, even though I was establishing things already covenant of peace, all of the monies and all of the ministry umbrella was lightnings of God ministries still today. Uh, it still operates today. Now, when I say still today, it still operates today, but all of it now is fallen under this, really the, the umbrella of covenant of peace because we put everything there, but I still have partners for lightnings of God and uh, 90% of everything, 90% of everything comes in, goes to world missions. I love it. There's people sitting here that partners with lightnings of God uh, ministries. But I was st- struggling. There's three faces in life, a land of not enough, a land of just enough, and a land of more than enough. God's people lived in all lands. Israel was in bondage in Egypt. They didn't have enough straw to even make brick. They lived in a land of not enough. They went into the desert they stayed in the land of just, just enough manna that day. Now, we talked about God got fed up and gave them enough quail that came out of their nose. Yeah. But if you read Psalm 78, while they were still chewing the meat, they began to curse God and complain. So the quail wasn't the answer, was it? Still had a heart problem. And the land of more than enough was the promised land. I lived in the land of between on the border of not enough to just enough. It's like I've stood at the equator, one foot on one side, one foot on the other. One side of one part of it was in the northern hemisphere. One part was in the southern hemisphere. People say, what hemisphere are you in? Neither. 
I'm in the middle. But all it is is one step either way. And you can begin to commit to one side. But I lived in that land of just enough to not enough. And God dealt with me about spiritual laws. That is, I've always been a tither. Never have I ever not been a tither. Man, as personal. My income, the partners, and all that was all lightnings of God. And God dealt with me about the tithe. And he dealt with me, and he kept saying, son, the tithe is not holy. The tithe is not holy. And talking about money, seed time and harvest, when you were mentioned that, giving produces. And this is spiritual law. And so uh, I used to say, I'm glad I'm not a part of this uh, uh, denomination, Sims of God, Church of God, da 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 that 15% of my money would have to go to that organization and do this. And because I would take 15% of everything that came in the likeness of God, I'd call it 10% tithe. Somebody said, I tithe 20%. Well, tithe means 10. So you tithe 10 and you give 10, but it's not all tithe. Okay. I would take 15%. I had three missionary organizations. I divided it in 33, 3, 33, 3, you know, to get to 10%. And then 5% just giving. And God kept dealing with me, but the tithe wasn't holy. And, and I kept saying, Lord, what do you mean? And that's when I started seeing tithe is up. Alms is out. One's vertical, one's horizontal. And God dealt with me that I'm taking that which is holy, that should be vertical, and I have made it horizontal. And he asked me, are these people your storehouse or you become their storehouse? And once I started fixing that, I remember battled that, battled that, battled that, battled that. I didn't tell anybody. I fought it. I fought it. And I remember having a conversation with the Lord in prayer and fasting. Lord, I knew that I had to give, get the tithe right and give it to the priest over my life. I knew I had to. And I said, Lord, if I do that, what do I do with the others? He said, you'll continue the same thing. And I said out loud, I'm just in a land of barely just enough at 10%, now you're committing me to 25%. And I have struggled with it. That head right there. Don't we look familiar? You know? <laughs> that head right there. That head right there was messing with me. So Angel and I were at Kenneth Copeland's minister's conference. And we went out to lunch after that session. And I couldn't even focus upon... I don't even know who preached the last session. I know who preached, but I don't know what he preached. And I told Angel, wait and get out of the long line of the parking lot. I said, I said uh, I, I, I've been in a battle for about six months. Uh, the tithe of the ministry is not holy. It's not right. I'm, I'm violating spiritual laws, and I've got to get out of this. It's hindering all of us. And, we're, and I'm supposed to take 10% totally and give it to the man of God, his ministry. But yet keep supporting the other ones. She looked over at me with that smile. She said, I've been knowing it the whole time. She said, but this had to come from you. That was January. February, I took that check. I said, I can't see you every day. I was a traveling man. But this is not offering. This is holy. You're going to pray over it. And when that comes through the mail, I've got to know that you know. That we know this is holy. From that moment on, I never lived in a land of just enough on a constant basis. I went from just enough further into it into a land of more than enough. I started operating 30 days in advance, 60 days in advance. I no longer needed $2,000 to get out of that month. The $2,000 was get out of the next month or the following month. I started living in a place where I could now be a blessing and not struggling because I got the spiritual law right. 
the spiritual law right. Now, all of you have a leader you should be looking to. Churches or whoever is your spiritual. You got to understand, it's not so much God wanting to bless me and Angel as a family to tithe, but my organization. And when you look at what comes out of this place, uh, we don't joke with it. And people say, how do you do what you do without, in the missions conference, not raising money? We don't have to. Because God has got to keep his word because we don't violate it. And that's where it's at. Amen. So that gets to it. That gets to that head. Very quickly, you remember the same thing happened with us. Yeah. Uh, we were in the barely get by mode in uh, small church. Tammy, being the school teacher, was the highest earning person in our church. Thus, the highest tithe. Um, and uh, God, I, I came under uh, Pastor Harbaugh in February of 2004. Shortly thereafter, God started dealing with me because we, we've been tithers and we use the tithe of the church for supporting missionaries because we've always supported missionaries and started dealing with me on the exact same thing. And this is where the problem began because if we lose her tithe, we just lost a good portion of our whole budget. And uh, I believe I called you up and told you that uh, God's been dealing with me, so we're going to start... And I uh, never told you at all. You no, oh, no never. He, never, he never spoke anything to me. I don't tell people that. And it was like immediately, well, I know it was immediately that when the tithe, when we got the tithe correct and kept it holy, we never went down. There, there wasn't a, that portion of the tithe. We, our budget did not drop. We grew. And it was, it was the most amazing thing to me. Exact same story as what, what he has, just like in a little bit different context. Uh, we're not a big church out in California. We, I think we averaged 76 people last year, you know, higher on some, lower on some. And we put uh, 100 and uh, I think it was 24 or 34,000 in missions on just the missions. And, and you, we're not cheap with you either. And uh, I, I tell our people all the time, ever since I met Pastor Harbaum, he's expensive. Uh, and... Uh, but you know what? It's worked greater and greater and greater and greater and greater. And, and we operate. I, I still can't believe I, my, my daughter handles the books like Janine does here. And I'm like, how do we have this money? She goes, I don't know. She goes, Cause there's no, like somebody writing a $50,000 check or something like that. And it's just amazing to me. God's math is miraculous, but I tell you what, to step over in it, you're going to battle the mind uh, in there. It was a mind battle. I, I remember this man said, you'll never have a project that you won't, that you'll be in it by yourself. And no matter what we did, we started that clinic. He picked it up. This conference, he'll call and ask me, what's your budget? I got 10% of it. And I'll make sure it's there. Uh, it never. And I don't require any of it. But when things work, they work. And uh, I say this because uh, I am some of your pastors. But I don't pastor the majority of you. But the truth is, these laws are laws. And I watch people believing for money to come to them, and they become like the Dead Sea. Take in, but no release. And it's not just the giving, it's that tithe. One of the men sitting right here from a third world country, at the dinner on Saturday night, first thing he did, he come hug my neck and put some money in my hand said I, th I, I want to thank you for what you do for us I didn't even know what it was until I went to bed that night you know it was a lot of money a lot of money for them a lot of money for, for, for them it's not the amount it's the heart it's the heart it's the heart and so this is not about trying to get you the tithe because if you do it's not benefiting me it's not benefiting the church or the conference what it does is it's setting you up for these laws that people get to the place to where it's about getting and not how to position yourself to get into that land of more than enough but if you if you get the salvation to your soul you'll see the end of your faith i wish above all things that you prosper and be in health as your prosperous all right all right let me give a uh, five minutes and we're going to give 10 10 minutes to give somebody in case they have a question i didn't want to take the whole thing of q a okay so an, another thing that people have besides 
uh, thinking money is their answer. Money's not your answer. The word of God's your answer. Faith comes by hearing. So you can have all the money and still go under because you don't have faith to mix with that. Okay, so whatever you do, you got to keep faith mixed with that, okay? Uh, there's betrayal and hurts. You got to learn how to fight with it without being totally offended to where just because somebody else violates a spiritual law to betray you, you cannot vi- violate your own to try to justify yourself. All right? God told me one time, I said, Lord, I need you to take care of that. He said, I'm trying to, but you keep trying to be your own avenger. I can't avenge what you're trying to do. Well, that was hard because I just wanted to go poke him in the chest and I spewed my feelings around people. But when I stopped that, I grew up in that area, then God began to be my adventure and started taking care of it and so uh so but most of it deals with that and if you got a weak family you having family problems you need to get that fixed or get off the field because what yeah, you're i had a conversation here recently with an individual that um they get offended very easy and they they struggle I mean, they're trying to get better but uh they still struggle with it and so they uh quoted peter and said, uh, okay, so I just got to learn how to cast my care over on God. And which is scripture. I mean, we cast our cares. But there's a place that I've kind of, one of my one of my confessions I make over my life every day is that I don't get offended. I deal with the offense before the offense ever comes. I, I've trained my thinking to not get offended. And I, and I told him, I said, yeah, but there's a place where you don't have to cast your care because you never take the care. And if you can get in that realm, life is a lot freer. That you don't have to take the problem, hold it, rub it, pat it on the head and then cast it over and then pull it back and rub it a little bit more and cast it over. And you get in this battle of casting it over and letting, just don't ever take it. And, uh, and there's a freedom in that. Total freedom. All right. Uh, why don't you take that mic and walk and see if anybody has a, oh, no, he's got a mic right there. Thank oh, okay. you, Tim. If somebody's got a question, we'll take the last uh, uh, 12 to 15 minutes and maybe answer, not at length, but answer a question. Anyone? All right, over here on the far side, Tim. Double time, Tim, double time. <laughs> you got very back. Um, I think you might have mentioned this. Wednesday night, Pastor. Go ahead and stand up, Ricky. Anybody oh, ask sorry. a question, stand up so we can I see. I think it. you might have mentioned this Wednesday night. You just said, you know, that money doesn't answer everything, but Ecclesiastes 10 and 19, you know, is the word, and it says money does answer everything. Um, and I guess we all need it, but um, the story of Daniel, when he said his prayers were hindered, and you know what I got going on, what I've got out there, how do we get maybe that quicker to come in the boat so we can continue to, to march on and do what we got to do? Because it seems like for us, you know, we've, you know, my heart and as much as we give, but it seems like that's always dangling out in front of us and it's so hard to get in. So how do you break that hindrance maybe sooner, I guess would be my question. All right. I don't know if it's something, uh, I guess the word to break, I really believe the same way that was released then by the heavenly host and what Terry's been talking about, the angels are there to help. I, I really believe that understanding this unseen force of heavenly hosts. A lot of people don't talk about angels because you're not supposed to worship angels. I, I don't. The point is, I believe in Hebrews, they are sent forth to minister for, not to. The minister for, to minister for them who are the heirs of salvation. So I believe everybody's got to, there's people got different doctrine, even, even uh, as close as Kenneth Hagin and Lester Summerall were. I think Lester Summerall was probably the most four, had more knowledge about demonic activity than anybody ever read after. But they differed in origins of demons and where they were at. Uh, I take the school of thought that they're fallen angels. That great dragon took one third, not disembodied spirits that was in a 
pre-Adamic system, so to speak. So with that, demons, evil spirits, influence. Influence people to commit suicide. They influence people to commit murder. They influence preachers to fall in immorality. They influence in a wicked way. So if those who were created in the same system by God, then they all have the ability and influence. So I have a, I, own, I believe, which I make it a part of my life, just as the fallen ones influence people to do wrong, those who retain their original status still have the ability to influence. Evil spirits influence people to leave your ministries, your partnership, your church. The heavenly ones, the holy ones, have people to influence to get back. They influence. Michael had to release that answer, however that looked, to get that to him. So I believe that which has been held up, even though I can't see it, the angels of God that's been assigned to me to be successful in that host still is what releases that out of that unseen realm to get it into the seen realm. And I, that's, it works the same way. It's just sometimes we fret on how do we break it free instead of just saying, there it is. Like Terry says, I want that knife here. He got some, he got some spiritual being to work, and it wasn't an evil one. Mm-hmm. Come on. These things are real. If he can get it through you, he can get it to you. To you. So that's the only thing I can think of. I, I, I believe the enemy knows that money will open up so many opportunities for ministry, Ricky, that if the other side of darkness can withhold it, we have to get the side of light and that holy side to break it free. And it's a constant battle through that. Are you at something? Yeah. Uh, I just did a three-week series on honor. And uh, the way I look at honor in the Bible, there's a lot of different, you know, honor your father and mother that it might go well with you. And uh, honor, esteem everybody, you know, and honor everybody around you. There's different passages on honor. And I look at them as honor is one thing, and there's many components, and the Bible teaches us about it. But very specifically, uh, on toward the spouse, that your prayers be not hindered. So I I believe that we impose a hindrance on ourselves, and correct me if you see it differently, uh, on ourselves because we don't live in the honor. And a lot of people don't really, to me, and, and some of the examples I use, churches across America, how many people walk in late? That's dishonorable to God. How many people at their phone uh, rings there in the service? They'll get up from the word of God. Remember, Mary stayed at Jesus' feet. Well, Martha was cumbered about. They'll get up and walk out. And a lot of them, as they're walking out, hey, can you hang on a minute? I'm in church. Yeah. You know, this, they, they've just placed that thing above the word of God, dishonorable. And there's a lot of arenas where I believe uh, we as American citizens, I think honor's just totally gone out the window, but we're, we're not living in honor in many capacities and we don't recognize where we're not living in honor. And uh, in the general sense, I think if we miss the honor, uh, we're going to hinder what we can walk in very specifically on the verse about honor. And that concept is uh, a man honoring his wife. And when we violate that, our prayers will be hindered. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. You're the I honor agree. man. I mean, you, you know yeah, this. I, I, I agree 100%. Uh, I, I think people that God wants to touch in services, I, I've got it in my spirit. But he can't get to them because while I'm preaching, they're in their phone, reading social media, different outlets, texting, news feeds. And God can't get it to them because they've dishonored the thing that's going on. So I, I believe We don't see those things as, as an honor issue. We don't we, see it. We don't see it. So All right. If we don't see those, how many other things are we dishonoring that we don't see? Amen. Come on. That's right. All right. Another one. Not all at one time. Dave Robinson, you was able to get more people to ask face questions than I am. So I don't know. You, you're better at this. All right. All the way over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling you what. Without that agitator in our washer, 
nothing gets clean. So I'm glad you're an agitator. You help us get clean. <laughs> uh, Pastor, mine is not a question, but uh, it's something that I observed when you were, when you were teaching. Uh, I like watching uh, National Geographic, especially the, uh, the cat family. I like watching it, and I want to reiterate on the issue that you said. Um, I might not be able to uh, paraphrase exactly, but you were talking about getting something that you can be able to maintain. Uh, I've watched uh, the cat family, if they are more than two, three, they can target a big uh, animal. Yeah. But if it's one, you see it looks for the small one or for the crippled one, the ones that are hurt, because it knows that it can tackle that. Yeah. So I think uh, we have to look into capacity when we are asking, because faith can give you anything, Amen. but you need capacity to maintain whatever you get. Amen. So I think uh, as missionaries also, we have to look into that, the things that we ask. And uh, I once had faith to have a helicopter, but uh, <laughs> I started looking at, uh, <laughs> am I capable? And I had to talk to uh, Ron, and he said, that thing has got a lot of things. That ten is very <laughs> expensive. I had to drop my desire. So, because I can't maintain it. Yeah. Even though I need it, but I can't maintain it. Right. Thank you. So, if you didn't get what he's saying, he said, in the cat family, uh, they three, at three at a time, they'll take a big, something bigger. But when they're small, they have to take something small and weak to survive. All right. Uh, tumble. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Ken. The, my question is on growing finances in a developing world. Um, most of the time you go to Africa, you find pastors working their socks out. They work hard. The families work hard. But the economy doesn't give back what their effort kind of uh, uh, maybe deserves. Where you find, you, you put, I remember when we, we were in the same ministry with Devson, Farai, and uh, we, we had an insurance where people would be told after 20 years, you would have set yourself up, at least for your future. But after 10 years, that thing was run dry. The economy just devoured things. So you find you have, you're, you're on a treadmill. You, you, you don't go anywhere. You, you look and say, but we're not growing young. Where is our future in the economy? That's why you find then People are looking at where are we going wrong in terms of our faith. Amen. So how do we okay. grow finances? I'm going to take your phrase and I'm going to use that. How do we grow finances? That's the exact words you said, right? How do you grow corn? If you want corn, do you plant beans? Do you plant peanuts? No, if you want corn, you plant. If you need money, you plant. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what happens is we either become Bible people and we believe in that other dimension. Isaac had the opportunity to do the same thing his daddy did, go to Egypt, because he was also in a land of famine. But out of obedience, the Bible said that by faith, he sowed his seed in a time of famine. Why are you sowing your seed in famine, man? The earth is, is burned up. There's nothing. You're wasting money. You're wasting your time. But he sowed his seed in a time of famine. And in the same Come on, help me. In the same, he reaped 
a hundredfold. He didn't break even. He reaped a hundredfold. I believe obedience is the key. I'm talking to my son, George Gache in Kisumu, Kenya, a week or so ago. He knows three pastors in Kisumu has closed the church down and went back to the rural area because the economy is so bad. All right. If God said, close your church down, then fine. But the truth is, I believe God wants to show himself alive, even in the time of famine. So I'm not responsible to make it work. I'm just responsible to believe and walk it out. God seems to have the way to make it work to sustain it. Isaac couldn't do anything to make that seed grow. But the blessing of the Lord was upon him. And not only did he receive a hundredfold that year, it says he increased and became great to where his enemies envied him in that area. So I know it looks difficult, not only in African nations. You said Africans work their socks off. America, a lot of Americans do the same thing. They do the same thing. They work their socks off. Uh, but the point is, labor without faith will produce disappointment. So you've got to labor in rest, enter into that rest. A lot of people work hard outside of faith, but you stay in that arena and you will, that will grow and increase. I am convinced that God can't lie. It's, he set precedent. Court of law says we have precedent that this is able. This is, this is now I can believe for. Are you a son of God? Are you the, so you, you could say the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Tumble. The same God is the same God that's going to produce in a time of famine. All right. That's for one thing. You got time for one thing? You got that too. Uh, And Pastor can confirm this. You've heard me preach on. I preach on the mind a lot, right? Mm -hmm. I have preached Romans 12 too so many times. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. And I stopped right there. And this year, it hit me, the, the next phrase on that, that you may prove... What is the good, acceptable word of God? And, and it, it resonated. Prove it. I've got to prove it. I've got to prove right now that God is bigger than inflation. I've got to prove right now that God is bigger than whatever other thing I'm going with. God's given me the word that will work, but I got to take the word and prove it. And I think so many people are waiting for God just to do it, which he's done everything already for us. But I've got to take that, that spiritual word and prove that I can beat this natural dynamic. Amen. Amen. Well, amen. Yes, Jerry. You can? Here, let's run it. Let's, let's take it. Jacob, get, get that to him. It's quicker than what Tim can get over there right now. Uh, I would just like to comment on the brother talking about uh, his fellow brothers in a very poor economy. And we work with indigenous tribes who are very, very poor. And I think one of the mistakes that we do as missionaries is that a lot of times we want to export ministry to where we are. And so we see what ministry is doing here and we want to imitate it. And I think we really need to be sensitive to what the Lord wants to do locally. And I believe that the Lord uses the local economy to do what he wants to do. And um, it would be a mistake for me to want to imitate what Brother John Mortimer is doing in Peru and take boats to Durango. (laughs) That's not going to work, right? (laughs) So uh, I I believe as we, you know, and, and considering everything the brothers have spoken, that we should be open to what God wants to do where we are. Uh, because he knows what's happening where we are, and he's not oblivious to it. And I think he can work through all that. And some of the things that we have seen uh, happen with our own uh, indigenous brothers is actually very impressive, because Amen. even in their own poverty, the things they can do and the things they can give, and, and 
what happens, it's actually very miraculous. Amen. So. I, I, I really believe it. People say, well, how did I do this without a sponsor? People did it for decades, centuries without sponsors. Because I believe, uh, I believe that God has the, the field you work in has the ability to produce. Huh? Is there time for a quick testimony yeah. about that? Yeah. What is the time for what? Uh, one quick testimony about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. One quick testimony, and then we'll let you take a break, and we'll get on there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we were facing the same thing with the uh, churches in Tanzania uh, where the pastors were afraid to ask their people for offerings because my people are too poor to give. Uh, my people are too right. poor to give. Deception. And so we're, we're telling them how they... The tithing principles. Oh, my people are too poor. He says, well, start with bring one egg if you got ten. Bring, you know, one ear of corn if you got ten type of thing. Get them started in it. And we, we taught on that real hard, real heavy for a whole seminar here a few years ago. Uh, they caught a hold of it. They're doing it. The churches are now to the place where each church is able to help the new churches that are getting started. They're building churches on their own instead of asking us for money to build them. They're uh, Amen. have found the principal yeah. works Amen. And, and they're proud of themselves right. for being able to accomplish what they used to look to others right. to do. And God gave them ability to start making indigenous brick yes. to build their church, yes. which now they're making so many people are buying brick off yes. of them to yes. build their churches. Yes. Now it's a total income. Yes. Yes. Become entrepreneurs yes. just by finding a way to believe what's in, in like two years, Our, you know, like a year. Yeah, with a year or two. Don't ever underestimate the law of the hand of Moses. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? God will use what's in your hand. Amen. All right, let's stand. Was this okay this morning? A little different format, but different, but some the same. And to have it. So um, there's no way. I'm sure all of you got testimonies and great stories and ability to teach it and explain it. And um, so uh, just thank you for opening your heart and uh, letting us uh, jump inside a minute. Amen. We're here to help. There's one thing that we did not say and uh, COVID and a lot of stuff hit it when he's talking about uh, how does pastors keep up with supporters. Uh, we launched something years ago called CGE, Covenant Global Evangelism, which out of that is where the online school of missions is also going to be embedded. But we started doing this to help ministries because a lot of pastors uh, don't know what's going on. They drop their support because missionaries can't communicate very well. So we did this. Now, we offered a lot of benefits. It's not really needed now because of the digital world. But we still have people that we receive all of their funds. We receive their donors, just like some of your organization that you're with. Uh, print newsletters, we get them out. Um, we did it for a long time at 7% because of uh, we didn't do it to make money. We did it to help. You can't do it for 7% now. It's more like 10. But somebody says, well, I can do it for free. No, you can't because you still buy paper, you still buy ink, and you still buy stamps. <laughs> so out of that 10%, we, we pay for it. Up to a certain point of your mailing list. So, you know, so we've really done things to try to my whole heart was to lift the burden of management so you can stay in the flow of your ministry. And that's what it was about. So now they come to us digitally prepared. We just copy and just do it. But uh, anyway, so uh, there's things out there to help you so you don't struggle in life. Amen.